from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Intel CEO Pat Galsinger says the chip shortage will linger for a couple of years, but that we are in for a decade of growth. I'll ask how he's working to win business back from Amazon and Alphabet. Plus, Twitter shares rally on the best revenue growth in years. Jack Dorsey says Bitcoin will be a big part of Twitter's future. I ask Twitter CFO Ned Siegel how he sees crypto being integrated into the platform. And the Prime Minister of Spain visits Silicon Valley to tap into the energy of the U.S. tech ecosystem and bring some of it back home. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is just out of a meeting with Apple CEO Tim Cook. We'll find out what was on the agenda. All of that in a moment, but first, let's get a look at the markets with Kriti Gupta. Kriti, what an end to the week as those blockbuster corporate profits push stocks to record highs. What are you watching? Absolutely, Emily. We started off the week with a lot of those COVID-19 variant concerns and now really involving to the end of the week with a lot of earning blockbusters. Today, a similar story. Story. We start off the week, off the day, I should say, with a lot of kind of broad market gains, but eventually evolving into a tech outperformance kind of day. You can see it right here. The S&P 500 up 1%, but volume was down 15. So stocks kind of drifting higher. A lot of that was responsible. Tech was responsible for the Nasdaq 100 up 1.2% as well. Well, what didn't do so well, though, those Chinese ADRs, Chinese tech having their worst day since 2008. You can see that a plunge of 9% in just one session. And while I was talking about that defensive bit, you see a little bit of money going into treasuries. I also want to hit some of the money going into semiconductors as well, because on a one year time frame, you are starting to see that global chip shortage really bolster those stocks. A little bit of lost momentum here, starting to see some stagnation, but they are still up quite a bit. The question here is, can they continue to to move higher, especially going to next week when we do are or when we are expecting a lot of that tech outperformance, which brings me to one chip maker stock in particular, and that is Intel. Remember, we covered earnings last night, really talking about how their data center revenue was really lagging and that that really was weighing on concerns for a lot of investors. You can see it really show up in the stock price today. Shares down 4% on a three day basis. That is quite the plunge, Emily. But like I said, a lot of investors are expecting that tech outperformance theme to continue into next week. So maybe just maybe maybe they can redeem themselves. All right, we're going to keep our eye on that. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, thanks so much. As Kriti mentioned, investors still cautious about Intel after the chipmaker's third quarter forecast fell short of expectations earlier. My colleague Alex Steele and I spoke with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger about his outlook, the chip shortage, and winning business back amidst stiffer competition. We had great performance in that area in Q2, above our expectation and well above the analyst uh, expectation. And as I said, we see growth in that area in the second half of the year. So cyclically, you know, we've gone through some of the you know, cloud you know, build of inventory and that's been consumed. So we're seeing the cloud guys uh, rebuilding uh, demand to us. In particular, we saw strength for the enterprise segment of that uh, business and we see that continuing into the second half. And we're also seeing some of the adjacencies, area like 5G and open and RAN and VRAN being very strong areas for us. So collectively, you know, we're seeing that momentum start to rebuild in that area. Our product line is also getting stronger. We've talked about our next generation, the Ice Lake product, you know, is now ramping very well, and that's a highly competitive part. So the competitiveness of the parts are getting better, the momentum in the industry is getting better, and our execution for the long term is getting better. So we're feeling much more optimistic than some of those reports might indicate. And overall, I'll say, boy, you know, Q2 was a great indicator of that, and our guide for the rest of the year you know, clearly affirms we're putting it out there. Now, Pat, you know, I know your relationships are key and you work hard on building those. How often are you talking to folks like Sundar Pichai and Andy Jassy, Tim Cook, Satya Nadella to try to lure some of that business back? And how are they responding to you? You know, initially when I came back to them, I said, boy, you know, we really want Intel to be back. But can we rebuild that confidence? And I've really leaned into all of those relationships and a few more, uh, Emily, and it's building. You know, they're seeing that shift in our focus, how we're leaning into the relationship, how we're putting more technical resources. 
on site, working with their teams, the improvements in the roadmap. So overall, I'd say we're very optimistic in that regard. Also, uh, like for our Foundry service, we announced that we have one of our first major customers as one of the big cloud guys. And we'll talk more about that uh, next week. So overall, I'm seeing very positive movement in that area of our business. And given my relationships with those individuals, in many cases are decades long uh, at this point, you know, we can really build on that long-term relationship, the renewal of our execution, and a shared view of what we can do in the future. Overall, this is going well. I'm curious about margins because investors are concerned about how much it's going to cost to get Intel back to that leadership position that you are so optimistic about. Um, you know, there's concerns about these companies building their own chips and a stronger AMD, and your margins are considerably lower than what they were. When do we get back to that 60% that a lot of investors are used to? Yeah, and clearly we, we overachieved on our margins in the first half of the year. They're lower in the second half of the year, in no small part because we're bringing on the new factories, which are yet to be depreciated. And that's a normal cycle in the business as we bring on you know, the uh, 10 and then seven nanometer costs uh, at scale. So it's very typical as we go through that and then they build up in the longer term. So overall, we feel comfortable with the uh, margin uh, profile for the business to you know, return to levels that the industry would expect. This is very normal uh, cycles. But I'd also say, hey, we are investing for long-term leadership and we're not apologizing about that. We are committed to be a growth company that is leading in technology and between R&D, capital, you know, we're going to make those investments to have that occur. We have an analyst session at the end of the year where we're going to lay out that multi-year picture to the marketplace uh, more clearly. But overall, we're not concerned about Q3 margins. You know, we're being more competitive. The products are being well accepted by our customers and we are exactly on the strategy that I've laid out. Now, I want to talk about the chip shortage. You said it hits bottom this year, but it'll linger for a couple of years. And I wonder how much that is adding to your optimism about the foundry business and taking on TSMC. Well, it certainly is a factor, Emily, because right now, everybody, you know, boy, you know, what do you got? Can you run more wafers for me? There is this clear search for supply in the industry, which is a bit of a tailwind. There's also very few companies that can do leading edge technology. So, you know, they're looking at us quite aggressively that way. Also, this rapid buildup of new capacity, it takes time. And building a new fab from scratch is a three to four year exercise to have it built. So all of that view of a cycle of significant demand. And as I've said, I think we're in for a decade of good semiconductor industry characteristics because every aspect of human existence is going digital. Everything digital needs semiconductors. So as you look underneath that, this is going to be a good cycle for semiconductors. Our foundry interests, and as I've said, we now have over 100 customer engagements uh, that are uh, active uh, today. And we're seeing a lot of interest in our capabilities because you know it's leading edge capabilities, it's modern node capabilities, it's unquestioned leadership on packaging technologies, the richest IP libraries in the industry, and a very strong top-down commitment from I and my leadership team to make this a big, successful business uh, for us. And we're going to give some more updates on this on Monday. So look forward to chatting with you after our updates on Monday, Emily. I look forward to that, Pat. Now, you know, we often talk about chips as a whole, but there are all different kinds of chips. And I wonder which chips come back sooner and which kinds of chips will take the longest to come out of this shortage? Yeah, the ones that are most challenging are some of those older nodes, as they would be described, Emily. And the, and the problem there is demand goes up, but we're not building those factories anymore. You know, these might be 10, 20, or sometimes even 30-year-old technologies. And typically, those factories run long and efficiently. But to capitalize a new one for a 20-year-old technology doesn't make a whole lot of business sense. And in some cases, the equipment vendors don't even build that equipment anymore. So the most acute shortages have been on some of those older nodes. And now you're left with the dilemma, do I keep building more capacity for those older nodes, or do I move those designs forward to more modern nodes. And clearly the economics of building trailing edge capacity versus moving the designs forward. And if we look inside, for instance, in the CHIPS Act, uh, as one uh, example, you know, there's specific funding in there to help modernize designs as opposed to building 
very old and essentially unfeasibly financially, you know, returns on older uh, capacity. So that's been the issue. The more modern yeah. nodes and leading nodes, we see shortages across all of the types, but that's been the biggest problem is these older nodes. Okay, now you are sticking to this idea that the PC market is gonna to continue to grow into next year. And a lot of other folks out there are saying, this is unsustainable, what we've seen during the pandemic, it's not gonna keep up. What are they not seeing that you are? Well, you know, I think first would be that we're just seeing this, uh, uh, you know, this view that uh, the PC penetration, as we uh, call it, is continuing as we go into the future. And for instance, almost every workplace even as they're saying come back to work, is saying it's gonna be hybrid work. So, you know, this idea of I need multiple PCs at home and, you know, kids doing more education and online activities, more health from home. So we see PC penetration being uh, continued to strong even as we start to move through the COVID issues. Secondly, we see a very powerful refresh cycle coming up. You know, we have aging PCs, the move to laptop uh, PCs, and also new Windows 11 from Microsoft always ushers in an upgrade uh, cycle. And for instance, with Windows 11, there's some new security capabilities that need new hardware. So this always is good for PC cycles. And finally, we continue to see the market broaden. And as you go to second and third tier markets where the PCs might only be one or two per hundred uh, kids in some of these markets, we're just seeing those growth rates continue. And as the GDPs of the world start to recover and growth is occurring there. So those three factors are what light leads us to have this depth of belief. And we've validated this with all of our channel partners, all of our OEM uh, partners, that not only is the PC market now comfortably over a million units a day, but we believe that will continue to increase in 22 and beyond. And you know, we're getting more and more consensus for that, even though there are still some naysayers in the marketplace more and more swinging to say, no, we think Intel got this one right. And we're building the capacity and the supply yeah. chains to be able to satisfy that. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger there. And don't forget, earnings continue next week. It is a who's who list of companies reporting. We're going to kick it off with Tesla Monday, then Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, and AMD all on Tuesday, PayPal, Qualcomm, and Facebook Wednesday, and we wrap the week with Amazon on Thursday. But next, we will stay with this week's earnings and snap, snapping back, the company reporting a blowout quarter from boosts in digital ads and e-commerce. But can it sustain the gains? We'll find out. And let's not what, forget what happened earlier this week when Jeff Bezos and three others landed safely after Blue Origin's first flight to space with passengers on board. I'll never forget it. This weekend, Bloomberg brings you a special program called Space Race that looks into the future of the space industry, including tourism. That's tonight, 7 p.m. Wall Street time, 4 p.m. on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Snap shares surging to a record after a blowout second quarter earnings report guidance coming in well ahead of analysts' expectations, making it a top pick in digital advertising. Our Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst, Mandeep Singh, with us now for more. So, Mandeep, this really took the market by surprise. What was so positive here about Snap's results? I think so far what we have seen is all these companies, you know, Snap, Twitter, they had the engagement, but they were lacking monetization. What this quarter proved is the pandemic accelerated, you know, the trends, uh, e-commerce, online gaming, and all these companies uh, basically need consumers. So they are coming to these online platforms to basically find those new customers. And that's what's driving, you know, the ad, tail, ad pricing tailwinds we saw for both Snap and Twitter. So we think really this is a multi-quarter trend in terms of ad inventory, being more valuable to advertisers. Anybody in the e-commerce realm right now, if they have to find customers, they will advertise on these platforms. And that's what we are seeing with Snap, Twitter, and we are gonna see it in Facebook's results as well next week. Snap is reaching a very specific audience, a younger audience that a lot of other services, including Twitter, can't reach. But my question is, can they keep it up? How much more will this audience grow?
Yes, that's a great point. So our view is we have hit peak user growth when it comes to uh, the daily active user growth, which is a key metric for investors. And in Snap's case, their daily active user is close to 90 million in North America, whereas Twitter is around 37 million, just to show the gap. And uh, I think if, as long as they can keep the engagement high, and that's the hard thing, when, when you are catering to 15 to 25 year old, uh, the loyalty is low, and we have seen that with uh, TikTok coming to the scene. They have gained users very quickly. So as long as Snap can keep the engagement, I think advertisers will continue to, uh, you know, uh, basically spend money, the marketing dollars on their platform. The other thing with Snap is their lead in augmented reality. We think that's a big source of differentiation when it comes to, you know, uh, what Snap is doing and, and their relevance in e-commerce. And that could be a big driver of ad spending on their platform. So quickly, Mandy, 30 seconds left. If, if that's the case, what do you think defines the next year of Snap? You know, post-pandemic, we hope, uh, out of lockdown and lots of other things competing for young people's attention. Big push into e-commerce. They just bought a company called Fit Analytics. We think you're going to see a lot more transactions. So advertising will continue to do well, but uh, Snap will become a source of commerce. And that's what we have seen with the Chinese companies, uh, the social media and e-commerce have converged. That's what we are going to see with Snap going forward. All right, Mandeep Singh, appreciate your insights. We'll see if your predictions ring true. Thank you. Coming up, what is old is new, at least in fashion, that is. How Gen Z is reviving the secondhand shopping market and why ThreadUp is betting big on the younger generation to do it. Our conversation with the CEO is next. Plus, the Prime Minister of Spain is in town. He will join me here on Bloomberg Technology, fresh out of meetings with tech CEOs, including Apple CEO Tim Cook, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, right here later this hour. This is Bloomberg. Amazon has hired an outside firm to investigate reports of toxic employee behavior in its cloud computing unit. The move following an internal petition from employees at AWS claiming systemic harassment, bullying, and bias against women and underrepresented groups. Adam Talipsky became CEO of AWS earlier this month, taking the reins from now Amazon CEO Andy Jassy. Talipsky told employees in an email that the company is committed to ensuring the workplace is inclusive, free of bias, and unfair treatment. We'll keep following that one. Meantime, the future of fashion in better news looks a lot like used clothes. And we have Gen Z in the pandemic to thank for that. According to a new report from ThreadUp, 33 million customers bought secondhand clothes for the first time in 2020. In fact, the secondhand clothing market is projected to double in the next five years to 77 billion. The trend certainly a good one for our wallets and of course the planet. For more on how to part with clothes sitting idle in your closet, let's bring in ThreadUp CEO and co-founder James Reinhardt. James, great to have you with us. So talk to us about the boom in secondhand clothing. What's really driving this? What are you seeing? I think there's this generational shift happening among young people, right? Who, you know, whether it's the vacations they're taking, the cars they're driving, you know, where their, their consumer preferences are changing. And I think a lot of these young people are moving into secondhand. Uh, secondhand provides great value. It allows folks to you know, find unique items and it's really fun. And so I think that's what's driving a lot of this momentum. And I think that was true during the pandemic. So you just released a resale report and you find that the trajectory of this will continue post pandemic, but how confident are you of that and what will continue to drive that trend? Is it Gen Z alone? Well, what we're seeing, what's really driving the trend, Emily, in the out years is how many new suppliers, how many new sellers are coming into the market. And when you look at the number of people who say, hey, I'm interested in, in getting rid of things that I no longer wear or parting with things that I no longer use, you know, that number is massive. And so when you look in the out years, what you're really seeing is this supply driven marketplace. And then I think on the buy side, what we're seeing is that when you do have great supply, you have great clothing, great brands at great prices, uh, you can attract a lot of buyers. And so we think that the demand will follow a high quality supply. And I think that's where ThreadUp uh, really differentiates itself 
on making it easy for consumers uh, to give us that supply. And I think that's why we feel a lot of confidence in the market. So I've sold on ThreadUp. I fought on ThreadUp. I'll say it Thank definitely you. feels good uh, when, when, when you know it's going to you know, someone who will enjoy it. And when you know uh, you're getting something special uh, that someone else loved, uh, essentially. But I yep. wonder, do you think secondhand sales will ever beat fast fashion in sales? Because fast fashion is taking sustainability in a totally different direction. It's worse for the environment. Yeah, I mean, look, it's something that I'm concerned personally about. I think as a company, you know, for for our kids, right, and for the planet, I think we all need to take a close look uh, at fast fashion and the implications that it has, you know, across the globe, uh, frankly. And you know, I'd like to believe that if brands and retailers can produce clothing that you know of higher quality, and we can build a great uh, resale uh, market for them, that that ultimately that that's a brighter future uh, for clothing supply chains. It's brighter uh, future for customers. And so I'm pretty bullish on this, this evolution of consumer behavior. And I think uh, retailers and brands will follow where the consumer is going. And I think that gives us a lot of confidence that, that fast fashion, uh, you know, that, that resale will be bigger than fast fashion over time. So I wonder what brands and retailers need to do to develop a strategy for re resale. I mean, do they have to think at the very beginning of design and production that, you know, ideally this piece will be passed down and passed down and passed yeah. down? Well, what, what's interesting is that's already happening. You know, there are companies all over the world that are thinking about their supply chains, not in the linear way that uh, supply chains have been built in the past where things get produced, uh, then they get sold, they get worn, and then they get put in, you know, put into a, a landfill. I think now most brands are thinking about the loop. And I think where we want to we want to help them and, and play is, hey, let us help be part of your circular strategy. And I think the most exciting thing is just how much has changed in the last two years where uh, the conversation for the brands, the conversation for retailers is we have to think about uh, the loop. We have to think about being more circular. And, and so I think that is coming, uh, but, it's, but you're right. It's going to touch every part uh, of the supply chain and um, it's going to be a big transformation, but, but I think it's the only path forward uh, for, for fashion to become more sustainable. All right. Uh, something we're going to continue to follow. James Reinhardt, CEO of ThreadUp. Thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, the return of the advertisers. Twitter reports better than expected ad revenue in its latest earnings as the world and businesses start to open back up. I'm going to sit down with Twitter CFO Ned Siegel next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to a look at how markets rounded out the week with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, we've been talking about how big tech has been outperforming the last month, even outperforming since that pandemic crash last year. But let's just take a look at social media stocks because they're kind of trading to their own tune here. This is the social media index that takes into account social media companies, not just from here in the States, but from around the world. Of course, housing the likes of Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook. And take a look at what's, what it's doing since that kind of advertising lot last year, you've seen that kind of this anticipation that advertising will indeed come back, really just continuing to rise, but then losing some of that momentum earlier this year and trading sideways. So given that background, it's very noticeable when the likes of Snapchat, for example, has these blowout earnings. If you take a look at a one month chart, for example, you do start to see that there is going to be a very clear differentiation. Take a look at this one month shares were dropping. And then today, this massive surge, 18 near 18% gains in those shares of course, of course, coming out with those massive revenue beats and, of course, a beat on those daily average users as well. Really important to keep in mind, though, that this also brought about a lot of analysts saying that this is now this company that is called the top pick for digital advertising. And some of that sentiment fell into Twitter as well, where you saw Twitter beat on the top and bottom line as well. This is a five-day chart, a little bit of that anticipation baked into the stock as we went into those earnings this week. And then today, of course, surging, making it a 8% gain on the week for Twitter. Going into earnings next week, Emily, let's just see if some of those other tech players can keep up. All right.
McCurdy, thanks so much for that update. Have a wonderful weekend. Meantime, Twitter shares, as Twitty mentioned, ending the day up after reporting the strongest revenue growth in years. I began by asking Twitter CFO Ned Siegel how well the social media giant is holding on to users it gained during lockdown. Take a listen to that conversation earlier today. We had a really strong quarter. We grew our audience 11% year over year. We added 20 million people to Twitter from last year, 7 million from last quarter. And we've noticed that the people who came to Twitter around the time that we all went into shelter in place last March, they've been staying with us better than previous cohorts have, which suggests to us that all the product work that we're doing to make it easier for people to find what they're looking for so they can trust what they see when they're on Twitter, that it's really working. Now, there's a lot of talk about how that Apple tracking prompt is disrupting the ad industry. I know you said it's not been a big deal for the business, but we've reported that only a fraction of users are opting in to ad tracking. And I'm curious, you know, what does this mean for the long term? Is it impacting your ability to show direct response ads? So remember, first, Twitter is about 85% brand and 15% direct response. We also historically haven't leveraged as much of the first party or third party signal as others have. We haven't done as great a job of it as we think we need to in the future. So we're coming at this from a different angle as others are, and we see real opportunity here. We've implemented the SK ad network. We're showing app install ads to more iOS customers than we were able to before. We did expect modest impact in Q2, and we were pleased with what we saw. I think it's too early to call a trend here because people are going to continue to make decisions about what they want to see because not everybody's upgraded to the new operating system yet and advertisers haven't fully adjusted but we feel like there's opportunity here for Twitter. Okay speaking of early Jack Dorsey recently said he sees Bitcoin being a big part of Twitter's future and I'm curious how you see that playing out. Do you expect users to tip other users in crypto or to, to, to pay for subscriptions with cryptocurrency? Well, first, I think I'd take a big step back and think about decentralization broadly for Twitter. That means decentralizing our workforce, which was something that we started to do long before COVID. It, we want access to the best talent wherever people are. We want them to work where they're most productive. When it comes to transactions in commerce, which will be coming to Twitter, we want people to be able to tip across borders. We want people to be able to subscribe to the best tweets. We want people to be able to pay Twitter and pay creators for their best content and for the premium features that we'll offer. As we've learned more and more about these, they really go well with the concept of decentralizing how value is exchanged and making sure that people can move dollars or move value from one border, one side of a border to another, uh, regardless of all the challenges that currently are in the way of that. So Jack talked a bit about that on the earnings call last night as a long-term opportunity for us to continue to break down the friction in between a creator and their customer on Twitter. All right. So this new subscription service, I know it is early days, but big picture, do you see this being a small complement to all the revenue that you're already bringing in, or will this be a big revenue driver in Over the future? Over time, we want subscriptions to be a big part of our company. But right now, advertising is firing on all cylinders. We had a, such a great quarter across geographies, across verticals. Ford, when they launched their electric version of the F-150, they had over a billion impressions uh, where people are talking about and engaging around the brand. The streamers, they grew their spend on Twitter over 40% sequentially in Q2, talking about their shows, talking about their service. When you take that advertising business and you combine it with the subscription opportunity, not just $3 for Twitter Blue in Australia and Canada where it's available today, but other price points, more features, some from creators, some from Twitter, we think there's big opportunity for, there for us over time. Now, you've also talked a lot about, uh, you know, Building smaller communities so people feel more comfortable posting. Could you see building out a groups product or something similar? Well, we've talked about communities as a real opportunity for us over time to reduce friction for people to share their thoughts on Twitter. So that means if Emily Chang wants to talk about something that isn't Bloomberg related, perhaps you'll tweet it directly to a community of people who have already said that that's something that they care about and want to hear more about. This can reduce friction to get people to share their thoughts more and just create even more great content on Twitter. Twitter CFO Ned Siegel there, but when am I ever talking about something not Bloomberg related? Come on. As we head to commercial break now, I want to take a look at shares of Facebook and Alphabet, two of the biggest tech movers of the day, both gaining on optimism about next week's earnings. I want to remind you what's ahead. Tesla Monday 
Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, and AMD Tuesday. PayPal, Qualcomm, and Facebook on Wednesday, and Amazon on Thursday. What a week. Plenty more still ahead this hour. The Prime Minister of Spain is with us. You don't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at some other tech stories making headlines around the world. China may ask companies that offer online tutoring to complement the school curriculum to go nonprofit. That could decimate the country's $100 billion ed tech industry. Bloomberg has learned that under new rules being considered, the tutoring firms would no longer be allowed to raise capital or go public. And those that have already listed will probably no longer be allowed to invest in or acquire education firms. Indian food delivery giant Zomato soared more than 80% in its debut. The $1.3 billion IPO is India's biggest since March 2020. Zomato is the first of a generation of internet unicorns to tap the country's capital markets and in turn has generated a frenzy among the local investment community. And General Motors is recalling its Chevy Bolt battery-powered vehicles for the second time in less than a year. This after two vehicles that were repaired in a previous recall caught fire. The recall affects almost 69,000 cars that have batteries made by South Korea-based LG Chem. Coming up next, my interview with Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain. We will talk about his efforts to attract startups and tech to his country and about his meeting today with Apple CEO Tim Cook. This is Bloomberg. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is here in Silicon Valley to help transform his country into a vibrant tech ecosystem. This after visiting New York, the financial heart of the United States, and LA, the entertainment and burgeoning space hub. Prime Minister Sanchez just wrapped up a meeting with the CEOs of Intel, Qualcomm, and LinkedIn, and he sat down with Tim Cook one-on-one -on -one at Apple headquarters. Prime Minister Sanchez joining us now from Palo Alto. Prime Minister Sanchez, great to have you with us. I have to ask about your meeting with Tim Cook. What exactly did you discuss? Tell us about some of the specific initiatives on the agenda. So, you know, I think that uh, it is very important nowadays to have these uh, direct conversations between the public administration and also the private sector. And so far, what I think the, the companies uh, appreciate for, for this, from the Spanish government is, you know, that we have a vision, that we have also a plan, and we, we want also to, to get them involved in a long-term transformation and modernization of, of my country, of Spain. So you're meeting with folks from not just Apple, but Qualcomm, PayPal, Zoom, Intel, what did you learn from them that you want to take back to Spain? And what were they curious to hear from you? So first of all, they appreciate this uh, direct conversation between the public and, and private sector, because I think it, it is crucial to have a, a kind of a partnership between the public and private in order to face all these huge challenges that we are facing as societies. Secondly, I also explained that in the aftermath of this pandemic, uh, we are about to, to begin this, this huge modernization of the economy, the Spanish economy, and therefore we're looking forward to, to have the U.S. investors and U.S. companies uh, to, join, to, to, to join us. So, you know, I explained the, the, the European Union funds that we are going to receive in Spain, $162 million. 40% uh, will be devoted for the next six years to, to green, uh, to the ecological transition. And secondly, uh, about 23, 28 sorry, percent of those uh, funds will be devoted to digitalization. In the end, there's a lot of interconnection between the green and the digital, and that is why I think that there are a lot of opportunities for uh, the U.S. companies, the IT companies in Spain in the future. Absolutely. So when you think of a company like Apple, did Tim Cook any, indicate any plans to expand Apple's presence in Spain and, and what that might involve? 
So uh, regarding this 28% uh, of uh, the funds that will be devoted to digitalization, uh, we are going to uh, expand a lot of investment on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and Apple is very uh, uh, you know, engaged on artificial intelligence in my country, in Spain. Also, we are um, uh, eager in, eager in to, to have a kind of audiovisual hub in, in Spain, to, to, to convert Spain in the European audiovisual hub. And therefore, well, Apple TV, of course, is, 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 is really welcome to, to join also this, this initiative. And uh, in the end, what, what we are uh, trying to, to, to aim Spain is you know, to become lead, leaders on uh, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and uh, quantum computing, and of course, uh, all related to, uh, to um, new technologies. Uh, we are also uh, transforming our educational system. We're also transforming and modernizing our vocational training system in order to, you know, to, to close this mismatch between the needs of talent that these companies uh, has and, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the qualification that we can provide from, from my country to, to these uh, IT companies. So, you know, I think that the, 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 the conversations were very positive. And, uh, and we're looking forward to, to, to have them uh, on board in this uh, huge transformation that we are facing in Spain. Meantime, uh, two of Spain's most exciting startups, as I understand it, recently decide, decided to list publicly elsewhere. Um, all funds listing in Amsterdam, the EV charger maker Wallbox doing a SPAC in New York. How do you make sure that Spain has the right infrastructure so that these companies can go public at home? So, you know, Spain is uh, leading the uh, fiber optic network in Europe. Uh, we, are, we want to, to lead also the 5G um, um, network in, in, in Spain and also in, in, in Europe. And, uh, and of course, um, what we need is um, uh, to, to create that talent in Spain. Uh, that is why it's so important the, all the revolution and the modernization of our ed educational system and vocational training. And what we did also and what we witnessed uh, during this year is uh, the, the, the massive investment on startup, uh, so 2.1 billion euros uh, uh, during this, this year uh, for startups. That is why we, we consider and we presented before uh, the Council of Ministers a new uh, law on a startup, which reduced dr dramatically the taxation, also bureaucracy. We, we create a specific uh, visa for uh, digital nomads. We, we are also um, um, reforming the insolvent, insolvency law in order to, to, to create this uh, second uh, chance uh, for uh, for uh, entrepreneurs. So in the end, what we are trying to do is to create an ecosystem uh, which uh, will allow the, the startups to, to, to grow in, in my country. And by the way, uh, this week, uh, last Monday, we, we create uh, for the first time in Europe this uh, Next Tech uh, Fund in order to allow uh, startups to scale up in the, in the short term. Uh, there will be, uh, this fund uh, will be uh, 4 billion euros, 2 billion euros coming from the public sector and 2 billion euros coming from the private sector. So, you know, we're very excited. Uh, I think that we have uh, many opportunities to offer to uh, foreign investors. And, uh, okay. and this is, you know, one, one of our major goals, yes. Volkswagen recently unveiled plans to make batteries and EVs in Spain off the back of the your plans to put European recovery funds to work. Are you talking to any other companies about this? Did uh, EVs come up in your conversation with Tim Cook? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the main assets that uh, my plan, the Spanish plan has, is that our policy is all coherence. So that is why I mentioned before the interconnection between the digital and the green. Uh, and that is why, you know, uh, in our uh, climate goal, we are so, so, uh, committed and the milestones are so demanding. So we're expecting uh, by the, the year 2030 to have 70, 74% of our electricity uh, consumption coming from renewable sources. And that is why also we are going to devote uh, uh, at least uh, 2 billion euros on disruptive 
or clean disruptive, uh, green dis disruptive um, uh, energy, for instance, uh, green, uh, green hydrogen. So, so, of course, we are going to devote a lot of resources on digitalization, but also I think that there's a huge opportunity for um, the digital companies to join us on uh, climate and all these green investments that we are, we are now uh, developing in Spain and executing in Spain. So speaking of energy, a lot of our viewers are very focused on IFM's purchase of a 23% stake in Natergy Energy, you know, one of your big utilities. And I'm curious what your feelings are about that. Are, are you at all concerned about foreign investors having such a significant stake in a strategic company? Can you give us any, any indication of how you're leaning on this and when we can get an expected decision? Not at all. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm here in Palo Alto in the U.S. precisely uh, attracting or trying to attract uh, foreign investors to, to Spain and we're uh, an open country. You know, the, Spain is the second uh, economy in the European Union uh, in terms of openness uh, to foreign investors and this is a, 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 a clear commitment from, from my side. The only thing is that we have to study uh, this dossier but of course, you know, uh, it is important to, you know, guarantee uh, that uh, Spain is uh, an open economy uh, that we are really, really welcome, welcoming all, all foreign investors. Okay. Uh, Mina, while you're visiting here, obviously the pandemic is still raging. There are a lot of concerns about the Delta variant. I know there are uh, concerns in Spain. You're putting new restrictions in place. And I'm wondering at this point, are you concerned that a resurgence of COVID is going to hinder your efforts to reopen the economy, to uh, revitalize the tech economy, um, given that, you know, things don't seem to be getting better in many parts of the world? Well, but you know what happens in Spain is, uh, I think, very, very important, uh, very positive, which is, uh, which is that we, we, we don't find any, any kind of re rejection from, from our population regarding uh, vaccines. Uh, um, this week uh, we reach 52% uh, of uh, our total population with, uh, that, that, are, that is fully vaccinated. Uh, we, we expect to, to, before the end of the summer, to have 70% of our population fully vaccinated. We are now starting to vaccinate the youth because we focus in the beginning of this vaccination campaign, you know, the, 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 age, the, the people which uh, ages, uh, um, you know, are, uh, they are older and, and of course, you know, most vulnerable to, uh, to COVID. So, you know, we, we, are, we are expecting um, a, a new phase in our fight against uh, COVID uh, and thanks to, to, to vaccines and the vaccination campaign and thanks mainly to, to, uh, to our population, we, we are, you know, uh, speeding up uh, day by day our vaccination campaign. So we're very positive and, and very optimistic about, uh, you know, the situation that we will face regarding the COVID uh, in September. Uh, I, one thing that I'm, I'm really proud of Spain is that uh, during this last uh, academic year, we uh, keep, uh, kept uh, open 99.5% uh, of our classrooms. So that this was uh, something, you know, incredible because if we compare to other countries, you know, unfortunately they had to wow. log uh, uh, schools, but uh, we, uh, we kept open our, our schools rooms uh, by 99.5% during this last academic year. And I'm so proud of it. Interesting. As a mother of four, uh, that's really interesting to hear and also um, appreciate your, your, yeah. your, um, sharing the, the, the stats on the vaccination rates. That, that is impressive. Um, you know, we started with Apple and I want to end there. You mentioned that Apple is investing in artificial intelligence in the country. You know, I'm curious if you can share any more information about Apple's strategy in Spain. Of course, they've got a huge presence across Europe, but what more should, should we expect to see from Apple in your country? Well, we expect uh, to, to have uh, an increase uh, uh, an increased investment of, of Apple in Spain in the coming, in the coming years uh, in these two fields. Uh, first of all, artificial intelligence. And uh, since we have this uh, huge uh, bet on uh, converting Spain, in converting Spain in a kind of a European audiovisual hub, uh, to see Apple TV also, you know, uh, uh, committed with, with my country, with Spain. But, you know, all, all the uh, conversations that I had with uh, 
the, the global uh, um, companies uh, that, that I had uh, during this uh, day, the, the, the insights and the, the, the feeling that I got is that, you know, uh, they, they count on Spain. They see that Spain is, um, you know, a safe country with a good quality of life and, of course, uh, um, affordable and, and competitive in, in prices. So, so I think that we have a great opportunity uh, uh, for, for both, for, for, for the Spanish government, or for my country, and also for, for the, all these uh, foreign investors and, and companies. And, and also my country is a, is a very a, a country committed with gender equality, with diversity, uh, and we're also very focused uh, regarding the, this new education system with the STEAM uh, for girls and for women. So, you know, we, we are an okay. open country and we're looking forward to, to have these, uh, you know, synergies uh, with, with, uh, with the U.S. investors and companies. Wonderful to hear where your priorities are. Uh, Prime Minister of Spain, Pedro Sanchez, welcome to Silicon Valley. I hope you enjoy the trip. Thanks so much for joining us. And that does Thank it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Please stay with us right here on Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Coming up next, we've got Ariel Investment CIO Rupal Bansali and Harvard professor Ken Rogoff next with my colleague David Weston. You don't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>